today I just kind of want to ask you about your journey、uh, from Japan all the way to Canada. And you've been, you lived in the States for a while.、Uh, and then just how you ended up in Hope as a brewer. So,、uh, so yes, you grew up in Japan, Osaka. And then what did you, what did you study there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I,、uh, I went to university and then I went into art history and aesthetics. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, so I know. <laughs> It's a bit of a weird thing.、Um, and、uh, I ended up、uh, studying abroad in Vermont for a year. Okay. And、uh, yeah, when I got there, I figured that I would try. I went to the supermarket and I was just floored by all this、uh, different kind of beer that was、uh, on the shelves. Mm hmm. So, you know, I was not quite at the, I, I wasn't quite 21 at that point. So I just kept asking my friend to like buy a bunch of beer for me and then like bring back different beers from different countries. I started off with Europe and slowly worked my way back to、uh, the United States. And、uh, yeah, that was a pretty significant year in terms of building up my taste. So, I mean, like, I, I, you asked me what I studied, and all I'm talking to you about、uh, to you is like about how I kept drinking beer at, in the United States. So, I guess that's a little bit off topic. But yeah, I,、uh, I went to the United States, and there were two things that I,、uh, I got out of it. One was、uh, the fact that I really wanted to study film because it was a little bit more popular, a little bit more、um, relevant、uh, in the modern world compared to art, is what I thought. I mean, I would change my idea about this later on, but that was what I.、Uh, so, film studies was something that I really got into while、uh, I was there. And the other thing was, I really got into craft beer. I just wanted to drink like these dark, heavy stouts and porters.、Wow. So,、uh, I went back to Japan, but I just figured that I probably would go back to the United States to stu-、uh, do more studying, and, but also to drink more craft beer. Wow, okay. So in Japan, what is the drink- drinking, legal drinking age in Japan?、Um, it's 20, but generally、uh, people stop asking you questions about your age around,、uh, right around when you're 18. It's a re- really weird kind of culture. So once you enter university, nobody asks for your ID, they assume that you're okay to drink. So <laughs> that was、uh, basically how it was. So Um, the thing is, there is a pretty kind of toxic binge drinking culture in Japan.、Mm-hmm. But the, uh, but the uh, good side about it is that it's fairly well monitored because,、uh, you know, drinking is a little bit less, there's, a,、uh, there's less stigma around drinking.、Mm-hmm. So,、uh, yeah, your parents know you're drinking.、Uh, when you turn 18, they take care of you or they make sure that you don't get to too much trouble. So,、um, there's some upsides, but、uh, there's also some downsides to,、uh, to the drinking culture there.、Mm-hmm. I remember I went to Japan once in high school, and then my friend saw a little, like, a Uh, machines, the vending machines. Oh, yeah. And then he was trying to buy a soda and then he got it and it turned out it was alcoholic. So, how do they guard against that? Oh, yeah, there's really nothing. I mean, you can be an eight year old kid and then you can just walk up to the vending machine and just get a bunch of beer and walk out. So, yeah, there's really. Yeah, so the restrictions are really loose. There's re- very little enforcement to speak of. Huh. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, there's something that I、uh, miss about there. Like being able to drink outside was the thing,、uh, one、oh, thing. Yeah. Yeah.、Uh-huh. yeah, being able to sit in a, a park on a bench on an、uh, afternoon and just sit around and drink beer, that was really lovely. <laughs> But then, how is like, the craft beer scene in Japan then? Yeah, when I got back from Vermont, I was looking for some stuff, but there was very little to speak of. I mean, there were a couple、uh, microbreweries started by expats in Tokyo. So that was、uh, like beer brewing and such.、Um, I think Yahoo Brewing was still there. That was also one of the big breweries in Japan. <laughs> and there's、uh, breweries like Mino Brewing, and also there's one from Niigata. Uh, that's also a brewery that's been around for quite a while from、uh, around the 90s.、Mm-hmm. Um, 
So there were some selections, but first of all, it was pretty hard to access. I mean, you needed to find a really high-end gro- grocery store or a high-end liquor store to find the beers. Mm-hmm. And then the beers were prohibitively expensive. Um, they were pro- probably around about 400 yen, so about $4 Canadian a bottle. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um, and oh yeah the Niigata brewery is called Echigo Beer Echigo Beer had the relatively cheap beers so I could get it for about three dollars uh, a can so mm-hmm. that was uh, th- uh, I got that a couple of times but other than that there wasn't too much uh, uh, variety to speak of mm. um, but there were still kind of interesting things going around. Like uh, there were some craft beer bars in Tokyo that were interesting. I remember one where my friend and I went to, which had $25 all-you-can-drink craft beer night. Well, yeah. Good. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it was a lovely night, but it was also a horrible idea. Because mm-hmm. you keep drinking. The, uh, when you get used to drinking like Asahi and Kirin and, and stuff, and then you go to a craft beer bar and you start drinking like these six, seven percent beers and it's all you can drink and you drink them all night. It's just a horrible hangover the next day. So there was that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like uh, that was still a very rare kind of endeavor. So generally, uh, craft beer was not very um, popular at that time. I think uh, craft beer became a lot more popular in recent years, probably in the past uh, five, six years or so. Yeah, I see. Oh, yeah. actually, I do want to ask, because I know that in Japan, home brewing is illegal, right? Mm, right. So did you did you ever do it in Japan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I bought this homebrew kit. I think uh, I think it's one of those. It's kind of like the Cooper's kit that you can get in Australia. Basically, mm-hmm. a can with liquid malt extract inside with a little packet that's supposed to help you with sanitizing and one little packet with like a yeast or something. Mm-hmm. I think that was the case. Um, so I took one of these things home and I basically diluted it uh, to the maximum amount that it, it, they recommend. I just wanted lots of beer, so I figured I would dilute it as much as possible. And then I threw this yeast in into like a barely sanitized, like I, I think it was just a bucket that I got. Yeah. Um, I didn't monitor the fermentation. I didn't care anything. I just put it into these plastic bottles that I grabbed from a... Uh, from these rooms in my uh, university, I just took a bunch of plastic uh, soda bottles and put them in and hoped that they were carbonate. Mm-hmm. They didn't carbonate. Mm-hmm. The beer was extremely watery. Yeah. I'm not even sure if the yeast really did anything. So mm-hmm. it was this horrible beer that I made. It was, uh, it basically tasted kind of like bar, uh, diluted barley tea, but, uh, yeah, so that was like my only experience. And uh, yeah, the weird thing is they do they still do sell these kits in Japan even if uh, even when home brewing is illegal. Mm-hmm. Um, they just come with a little bit of warning saying that it's illegal to make anything over 1%. Yeah. So but... that's what I was supposed to be uh, so I didn't really follow the guidelines. I made something probably a little bit stronger, but it was uh was still a really horrible beer that I ended up making. So I never went, I didn't go back to uh, brewing my own beer for at least a decade or so after that. So, okay, you were in Japan in school, then you went to Vermont for a year to study in your 20s, when you were 20. And then you went back to Japan to finish up your your university degree? Yeah, I finished it up. And that was, uh, after I got back to Japan was uh, when I did my first and you know uh homebrew attempt that i didn't really go back to for a while yeah understandable Mm. yeah and then uh and then what how did you when did you next go back to north america um after i finished university i started applying to graduate programs uh Mm -hmm. that had uh film uh, that had film studies uh programs and uh i ended up uh getting a scholarship for uh ohio university so i ended up going there okay yeah so just to do my master's in uh in film studies at that point okay but then you told me you have a phd in queer studies 
Oh gender. yeah, yeah. Um, it's not. Uh, my degree wasn't in uh, uh, queer theory or gender studies, but uh, after that, I went to uh, University of Kansas to do uh, PhD in film and media studies. Mm-hmm. And um, even in Ohio, I was uh, kind of already dabbling in a bit of a uh, queer theory. I was uh, my thesis was on these uh, Japanese gay softcore porn films. Um, and when I went to University of Kansas, uh, I started uh, kind of focusing more on how uh, gay men were represented in Japanese media in the 1990s. Wow. So, um, so yeah, I, um, I, what I did there was mostly a lot of media, stu- uh, kind of getting a, a good basis in media studies, but also uh, studying uh, queer theory and gender studies with uh, faculty from those departments was uh, was something that I did. Wow, that sounds so interesting. <laughs> but then, okay, wait, if you were researching like queer men in like. Porn. Did you say porn? No, not porn. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was softcore porn. So it's not oh. like actual penetration. It's just, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, kind of a loose narrative and a lot of sex. So you have to and, like watch a lot of softcore Japanese porn then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I watched quite a bit. Oh, that's pretty funny. Yeah, it's pretty. It's actually pretty interesting. Um, softcore porn's generally been sorry. I'm. I know that I shouldn't go into this catch up about softcore <laughs> no, porn. So no, no, yeah. no, um, they have uh, in Japan. There is a pretty long tradition of uh, well-known directors starting from softcore porn uh-huh. because the production time and the pro- uh, production time is really short. The production budget is really small. But because of that, they have a lot of uh, creative uh, freedom. So mm-hmm. the softcore porn is like, uh, at times, uh, you know, it's really not what you expect. It almost uh, comes out looking like a very avant-garde art house film. Um, one of the softcore porn films that I watched was uh, actually a, um, a tribute to uh, an Italian uh, di- uh, director who makes these anti-fascist films. And there was a softcore porn film that was a tribute to it. So it was very weird. It had this extremely convoluted narrative that seemed to go nowhere. And I think he was named as uh, one of the three great softcore porn directors of Japan. Great, not because of the quality of his work, but great meaning like he had a great capacity of driving audiences away from the theaters. Oh my god! Oh, wait, yeah. what is this? Uh, what is this film called? Now I like want to go watch it. Oh, it's called Muscle. I think that's the North American name. Thank you. Hmm. I'll check that out later. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think you can actually find its subtitled copies in uh, North America with that. It actually made a lot of the uh, film festival circuits because uh, mm-hmm. it was kind of considered. Uh, softcore porn film, but also like an art film. So, okay, yeah, interesting, yes. interesting. All right, okay. So you did your PhD at Kansas University, and so how did you get back into brewing then? Oh yeah, um, I finished my courses and my uh, comprehensive exams, but uh, I was uh, I still had to write my dissertation. And then at that point, my partner, she was uh, studying uh, her degree in uh, gender studies at uh, SFU, Simon Fraser University uh, in BC. So I figured that I would move uh, move to be with her because at that point, if you're just writing, you don't really need to be physically uh, around your university. Mm-hmm. And I figured I can use the resources in BC, like the SFU library and stuff, to do my research. So that's why I ended up moving to BC. And looking for jobs was just a horrible thing uh, when I came here. Because first of all, I only had, after university, I only had experience doing academic stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, teaching was uh, something that I, I could do. But uh, I didn't have any retail experience. I didn't have any other experience that I can fall back on. Mm-hmm. So I was basically sending out resumes to everything that I can find, like uh, work at archives, uh, work in university libraries, 
uh, teaching uh, jobs, but also a lot of coffee shops and stuff that never got back to me because uh, I was too lazy to type my uh, type up a alternate resume. So I just sent them my teaching resume, which was a horrible idea. Now that I think of it, <laughs> so there was like a eight nine month period where I didn't have a job, and my partner she just basically supported me by the money she made as a teaching assistant, which is <laughs> not very much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were very poor, and at that point, one of uh, my partner's friends' boyfriend, um, he gave me a carboy because I told him I liked beer, and he <laughs> said he had some uh, experience in brewing. And I was looking at it and thinking, I have this, so I might as well as uh, try make something out of it. So mm-hmm. I went to the homebrew shops, bought like the uh minimum amount of ex- uh uh equipment as i can and then i just source other stuff through like the free section on craigslist and cobbled together a system i think i had a big canning pot to start out with mm-hmm. and i started making beer so that we have beer to drink mm-hmm. um Our beer budget was so low at that point that uh, my tactic was to kind of figure out how much money I was uh, paying per percentage of uh, percentage of alcohol Mm -hmm. so that I can get drunk on a budget. And also I I was buying uh, malt liquor to uh, blend with like ginger ale or something to make it drinkable so I can keep drinking. Wow. I also went through a... (laughs) I also went through a stint of making uh, Korean rice wine makgeolli. Ooh! Yeah, okay. that was fun. Because um, uh, we were living around low heat, so there was a bunch of uh, Korean grocery stores. I could get the uh, the enzymes for rice uh, rice wine making pretty cheap. Mm-hmm. And we always had rice around in our house anyway, so I would just, uh, you know, uh, boil up and make a bunch of rice stir in the enzymes, uh, put in some bread uh, yeast and leave it for a week and there was alcohol for me to drink. Wow. Is yeah. that like really easy to make? It was actually, yeah, it's actually pretty easy. The only difficult part is, uh, or the labor intensive part is probably straining it and also uh-huh. cooling down the rice. Uh-huh. It's actually really fun to make and it's uh-huh. really good too. Okay, yeah. I, I, I'm going to try to make this. Oh, I'm yeah, yeah, you, you definitely should. It's a, it's a great thing to make. Okay. Giving me all these great recommendations, <laughs> making rice wine, softcore porn film. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's like, you know, uh, that's like the best uh, pandemic kind of uh, recreation, right? Making your own rice wine and sipping it while watching softcore porn. It's beautiful. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, well, actually, what do you what do your parents think? Like, when you <laughs> tell them what you are studying, like I'm doing a research paper on like queer studies of Japanese men. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and definitely, like, uh, you know, it's kind of refreshing to talk to like older people in Canada because they get it, right? Like, uh, they've they have a country where uh, you know education about sexuality is like there. Uh, with my parents, uh, I was uh, I have an older sister who had who got better grades than me, and you know, who seemed to have a more promising future. So like uh, I was always the one that they kind of gave up on. So uh, so I had a lot of freedom because of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, they were very excited that I was uh, getting into academia because you know it sounds nice and prestigious. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they heard about what I'm studying, um, they were they were kind of expressionless. They were like, "Okay, that that is, can you get paid by doing that?" And mm-hmm. I said yes, and they were like, "Okay, then that's good." Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's good enough. Good enough. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah, I think there's still like, uh, yeah, there's um, stuff like gender studies is definitely not as common in um, in places like uh, in uh, in Japan yet. So that's uh, yeah, it's a little bit harder to get uh, people to understand what I'm doing. But oh hmm. yeah, um, yeah. So you're in BC, and then you were home brewing. And how did you get started at Moody Ales then? Oh yeah, um, 
I, yeah, I think I put an application in to be their tasting room manager, uh, t- uh, tasting room staff when they were mm-hmm. opening. Mm-hmm. Um, they haven't opened at this point yet, so I just, uh, you know, uh, yeah, they were just looking for people to start out with. And uh, as usual, I just send them my teaching resume without mm-hmm. really altering anything. So I'm just surprised that they even decided to interview me, but they did. And I brought in a uh, six pack of a British mild that I made at that mm-hmm. point. And I think it was, uh, yeah, it was Adam. Uh, there's another Adam and uh, Moody. That's like, uh, there's a Adam Crandall is one of the owners and Dan Helmer's the other owner. And Adam mm-hmm. was a, uh, there to interview me and he would drank my mild and he seemed to like it. Mm-hmm. And then he asked me if I, uh, if I was really interested in like, uh, doing production, um, I can come around and volunteer at the brewery for a while. Mm-hmm. And, uh, since I didn't have any jobs going on at that time, I decided to, uh, take, uh, take the offer to work for free. And I just went and started working for free for a while. Yeah, I also had that offer to volunteer <laughs> there. And then I was kind of like, no, I think I'd like to get paid. <laughs> uh, yeah. I know. I, I think it's a, it's a weird thing about the brewing industry, right? It seems fairly common to do those kind of uh, volunteer deals. but uh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's like... Uh, I think it's something that happens in a lot of industries where people kind of think of think of it partly as a hobby, mm-hmm. where, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, there's an expectation that, you know, like you do this for your passion. So you can't. Uh, so, you know, we're not going to pay you uh, pay you for it kind of thing. <laughs> OK, yeah, um, it's a weird thing, but I, I get. Yeah, yeah. It, it's nice to get paid for labor. Yes, and uh, for uh, to their defense, it's uh, I did start getting paid uh, like a month in, so I didn't have to actually go on doing free labor for too long. A month, so you went in for a month, like every single day. You uh, were. I think I was there maybe twice a week or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. it's not that. Awful. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> okay. Um... Yeah, but yeah, I think. I think labor is always like a weird topic in brewing. It's, mm-hmm. uh, I think there's still a lot of problems with like uh, general labor practices, which I think mm-hmm. uh, is something that the industry really needs to work on. Mm-hmm. Is that, do you think that's specific to the BC craft industry or just uh, it, the, the beer craft industry in general? Um, I think. I think the cra- North American craft bre- uh, brewery industry in general, probably, because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you would um, just because I've been kind of tracking, like, how much people get compensated for their work and uh, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And I, I mean, it's not just uh, pay. It's also like the time constraints and stuff, the mm-hmm. irregular, uh, the non-regular times, the lack of kind of uh, security in terms of jobs and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I, I often think that uh, think about it when people, you know, when there's topics about like uh, increasing diversity uh, in the brewing industry, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and if the in, if the jobs in the industry are not attractive to begin with, then it doesn't really make sense to you know if you're going to be enter if uh, people are uh, if people from marginalized societies, marginalized cultures are coming in the industry. And they're working in a somewhat exploitative like environment. Then it doesn't really make sense, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. But yeah, that's a whole other kind of yeah, topic. Yeah. 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 But mm-hmm. how do you feel like as a person of color working in the craft beer industry? Do you feel like your voice is equal to everyone else, or what are your thoughts? I don't know. I think like uh, it definitely. Uh, I mean, it definitely depends on who you're talking to or who you're interacting with. What I really liked about Daniel uh, working with Daniel and uh, Adam is that they knew uh, the kind of things that I was into. They knew uh, they were interested in like my background. Mm-hmm. So I think they have a general 
kind of uh, respect for uh, we have mutual respect for each other as people. Like we know mm-hmm. that we are kind of multifaceted beings with various backgrounds, and we have our own strengths. Um, but you know, like uh, a lot of times in the industry, I kind of felt like uh, people treated me as a specialist, kind of uh, somebody who has very specialized knowledge about a very narrow topic, <laughs> but not uh, not anything else. I don't know if you've been following like the uh, Bon Appetit stuff. Like uh, Bon Appetit had kind of a scandal with like uh, oh, their yeah, yeah yeah yeah, and like one of the people who are uh, the main part of it, Sola. So like, like yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a I think there was a thing where uh, they were talking about um, how Sola's uh, how she was using the videos was very problematic, where people would you know she wouldn't be featured as one of the main people in the videos. Mm-hmm. But anytime they had a question, they'd be like, hey, Sola, can you talk about this? Oh, hey, Sola, can you talk about how these, uh, this type of fermentation works? Mm-hmm. So she was treated not as a kind of a person who had a general kind of, uh, who had very general abilities in terms of producing herself uh, mm-hmm. and then uh, kind of creating a show around herself. But she was mm-hmm. uh, treated as a specialist with very limited and very specialized knowledge. Hmm. And I sometimes feel like that kind of stuff happens to you uh, in the industry. Maybe that was pro- uh, that might have been because of my personality where I would usually only talk about beer. Mm-hmm. Or maybe it was because like I was uh, the pilot brewer, so people figured that I was really into this weird kind of brewing knowledge and that's what they were looking from me. But... It does get a little bit old when uh, when the topic comes into marketing or when the topic comes to social media or something. Uh, people don't really uh, seem to ask for your opinions. Mm-hmm. But is that because your role was in production in brewing and that wasn't really your area? I don't know. I mean, that. Uh, I think that could uh, that could very well maybe. But I sometimes did feel like I couldn't really get a word in, in terms mm-hmm. of like uh, what kind of uh, how things should be represented on social media or you know th- uh, those kind of things. All this uh, all this thing is just a. There's really nothing concrete. There's really no like a- actual very tangible kind of. Uh, piece of evidence I can say to say I was mistreated or anything. And I don't really think my situation amounts to mistreatment. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I do feel like I do get kind of uh, typecasted from time to time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Like, uh, can I ask you questions back? Is that allowed? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Like, uh, I think, uh, I just generally think that it's, uh, um, Women of color do have a lot harder, a uh, uh, lot harder time, or a much uh, kind of like a solid glass ceiling. Mm-hmm. But uh, just from what I hear from my partner about, uh, you know, like her experience teaching, we have very vastly different experiences uh, with teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that was just my kind of uh, assumption, but. What did you think? Like uh, you've been in the distilling, uh, distilling, and uh, somewhat in the brewing industry. Um, I'll say, like, yeah. I think one story that always comes back to my mind is one time I was working in the UK at a distillery, and one of the like people in management that day, he came up to me and he was like oh, um, we have some special guests from China coming. It'd be great if you have time, if you could just like come and say hello. Uh, And so, yeah, he said that at the beginning of the day. Mm. And then the people came and I was clearly working and like doing something. But then he came all the way to find me again and be like, oh, if you're not busy, it's like, clearly I was busy. (laughs) If you're not busy, maybe you could come upstairs and say hello to them. And then he brought me up like I was some kind of, I felt like some kind of zoo animal. Oh, yeah. Look, we have an Asian too. But yeah, and then it was funny because they, it was like a big group from China. Mm. 
and then like they speak uh mandarin and i speak cantonese i speak cantonese so it was like we couldn't even communicate and then they were like oh we're from this place in china and i was like oh great i don't know where that is i was born in canada (laughs) so we had nothing to say to each other and then yeah i just went back and left um but it really struck me because there were other people working in the distillery that day. It wasn't mm. just me there, but no one else was asked to say hello. It was only me. I was like dragged out just to say hello to them. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, I guess it, it's understandable if the manager uh, knew that, you know, like you, uh, you spoke Cantonese and if they were also from like, you know, Hong Kong or something, then uh, it would make sense. To a certain extent, but he, it seems like he was pretty oblivious about your background, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so oblivious. Yeah. And then I, I did like, I didn't say anything, but when like someone does that to you, you lose respect for them. Oh, inside, yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. So that's probably the most obvious example I can mm. think of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. but I feel like these kind of things are difficult because a lot of the times, uh, you know, uh, there's there's often a sense that you know like uh maybe things are not working out for you as it is for other people but mm-hmm. it's only a feeling it's not it's hard to accumulate tangible evidence to say i'm being mistreated or there's a uh there's some sort of uh you know racist sentiments uh going around here or something mm-hmm. and why did you eventually leave and go with adam to mountain view Oh, because I liked Adam. Adam was, uh, I would, uh, I met him at Moody Ales and he was gone by the time the uh, bakery started. But uh, he was one of the few guys that I would have really extended conversations at Moody. I had a good feeling about him and uh, I figured that it's probably nicer to work with, you know, somebody who's your actual friend rather than somebody who may not be not that you know like i have no ill uh feelings towards dan and adam but uh yeah i guess i had a, a kind of a strong uh personal relationship with uh adam uh, adam kyle so when he was uh building a brewery i came here to attend one of his daughter's birthday parties mm-hmm. and i looked at the space i thought it was nice i thought his whole concept was nice so i would ask him if he was uh looking for somebody to brew for him here. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even think that uh, I was going to be working as a head brewer. I mm-hmm. I thought, you know, like uh, Adam would be head brewer and I would be his assistant brewer or something. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but, you know, he said yes. And then we started talking and then he sent me the contract and it said head brewer. And I was like, oh, okay. So this is what he wants me to do. Well, that's mm-hmm. nice of him. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of how it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why wouldn't you be head brewer? You have so much like experience <laughs> opening the bakery, and you like home brew so much. I mean, yeah, you should be head brewer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it was a uh, it was a nice change because uh, bakery was really fun, but also the pacing was too fast for me. Mm-hmm. We would never get a chance to really work on our recipes because, like. Uh, mm. We were the expectation was we were always going to be producing new beer one after another. So like uh, you can't work on a recipe when you're doing that. You just uh, create new stuff again, uh, new stuff and more new stuff and more new stuff, and you can't really stop and enjoy what this yeast, what kind of flavors this uh, yeast produces if you change the temperature a bit. Or mm-hmm. if you can just uh, work on this uh, uh, certain recipe and change up the finishing hops a bit and see what kind of differences there are. So you can't really work on subtle uh, changes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You just kind of try to aim for a general flavor you want and you're sometimes successful, you're sometimes not. And that kind of uh, taking that big gamble and making a recipe just for commercial distribution on the first try is something that I'm, I was never really comfortable with. I feel like you're very like cerebral as a brewer. Like you think about it a lot and you do a lot of research beforehand. So how, where do you learn a lot of your brewing techniques from? 
Yeah, I mean, like, uh, it's a mix. Uh, I mean, of course, I still get a lot of information from home brewing stuff, mm -hmm. but uh, I also um, do a lot of uh, searching for academic articles and academic research on hops or yeast. Um, mm -hmm. It's like I'm not I don't have a science background, so it's all kind of goes over my head. But sometimes I can get nuggets of information that's pretty helpful. That's the main stuff. And also like there's the forums and stuff that's all, all that has like a mixture of uh, amateurs and professionals, like something like Milk the Funk is always kind of fun to read. And mm -hmm. on top of that, they also have people chiming in with like academic uh, um, scholarly uh, sources. Mm -hmm. So that's also uh, very helpful. I don't know. I have this thing where I feel like if the source is not credible, then I can't really, I don't feel really comfortable with that information. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of research, but I think a lot of it is, uh, I just kind of push to the side as like something that might not be totally dependable. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, uh, what I'm saying is that, yeah, I think I do a good amount of research and I read up on stuff a lot, but it's a very inefficient process, which mm. is pretty much like says the whole thing about my being as a whole. I'm a very inefficient being working with very mm. inefficient processes that I built up over time and I just can't kind of break away from it. No. Okay. Well, I mean, learning is always, there's always more to learn. Always. Oh, yeah. more. And what's your favorite style of beer? Do you have one? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, uh, no, actually, I can't really say I have one because I really love all of the beers. I mean, I love, like, flat, warm cask beers. I also love crisp pilsners. I even love going to a dive bar and getting a really light American lager in a frosted mug. I know frosted mugs are very, very not trendy for craft beer drinkers, mm -hmm. but I still love getting that. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and but every time, uh, whenever I go somewhere and find something that's fermented with Brettanomyces or uh, um, any of those kind of funky cultures, I get pretty excited. So uh, that's also so. I guess the short answer is I still love all of the beers, so it's kind of hard for me to decide. Okay. Yeah. So what? What do you think your future holds? Do you want to stay in brewing or what would you like to do? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, uh, I would like to stay in brewing. Um, I really want to try and produce some uh, academic uh, work on the cultures of brewing if I can. I mean, I can't really think of a specific topic yet. I was, uh, I did do like a uh, uh, presentation at a food uh, studies conference about mm -hmm. nostalgia and pharma uh, farmhouse ale brewing. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so that kind of stuff was pretty fun. But uh, I also found out that there's like a person in. Um, SFU doing like studies on uh, labor movements, mm -hmm. and he was uh, he was writing a bit about like uh, Peril Forty Nine and like the scandal that they had, um, and you know like uh, the idea of unionizing and stuff. So that kind of stuff is pretty interesting to me. I would like if I could work with something like that and start doing like maybe like a ethnographic study of. Uh, labor conditions and breweries or something i think that would be really interesting but of course i also just want to keep on brewing beer at mountain view brewing and then uh hopefully we'll be able to start producing like uh you know funky kind of uh lambic style beers or something soon something that would kind of mix up like the very easy easy drinking beers that we do oh yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to lambic yeah. i do like them yeah. All right, Sho, it was great talking to you today. Um, I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah, uh, it was lovely talking to you too. And yeah, let's, uh, let's definitely keep, uh, keep a conversation going. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye. Bye.